Um, some of you guys have, might have seen me before on Facebook. I am also a Saad's personal trainer. So, <laughs> I'm not familiar to you. All right. Um, today we are talking about the wonder of Jesus' flight to Egypt. And we're in Matthew 2. So let's pray before we start. Father God, I thank you for this chance and this opportunity to present your word. I pray that you would use me mightily to speak your truth, to tell about your son, Jesus Christ, and how we may follow him and how we may worship him. So God, be here in this time. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. How do you imagine Christmas? What, what do you think about when you think of the birth of Jesus, the nativity scene? Let me show you what some of you guys think of. Right here, Hallmark. <laughs> In this picture right here, there are two people in the desert in the Middle East with red hair. <laughs> that makes no sense. <laughs> okay. Um, there's also a donkey there that's the whitest donkey I've ever seen. <laughs> I've never seen this donkey so white. You know why I like this though? The reason why I like this is because people of God have always wanted to identify with the nativity scene. Right? We want to feel like the wise man, Jesus, everyone who's there is like one of us. And so we, we make them have red hair. Some, some of you are blonde in that too. Okay. So we make them look very American. And then like, okay, we can identify with this. The danger is sometimes we impose what we believe about the Bible onto the Bible. And we don't read the text for what it really is. So today I want to explore the world of Jesus in Matthew 2. I want to maybe challenge some of your ideas about what, how you guys think, think of Christmas. Because we have so many Charlie Brown specials and... Christmas specials that uh, sometimes we get confused of what's actually in the Bible. So let's explore the world of Jesus. Let's explore what's actually happening during Jesus' time. Matthew 2.13, it says, When they had gone, the wise men, to the east, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. And get up, he said, take the, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. When Jesus comes to the earth, there's a star, right? Astronomy changes. Wise men from the east bring gold, frankincense, and myrrh to Jesus. Shepherds out in the fields come to Jesus. It's, a, it's like a glorious time. All these wonderful things are happening. So if you're, if you're Mary and Joseph and you have this child born, first of all, all these miracles happen before Jesus' birth. And then shepherds come and the sky opens up and the stars and wise men from the east and everything's super happy. And you know that this is the Son of God and that He's going to do amazing things. So, after the wise men leave, you're like, what's next? After all that assignment, after the, the, you know, the galaxies declare the glory of God, what is next? Dream happens. Get up, he says, and take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. That's what's next. That's what's next. After a star of the sky appears, Angels appear, the wise men from the east appear, and all this awesome stuff happens. The next thing that's going to happen is, the ruler of your land is going to try to kill your son. The land that you call home, and that you grew up in your entire life, and like you feel like this is your place, the ruler of that land is going to kill your son. So flee to Egypt. Jesus is about to become a refugee. I may have never thought about that. Jesus is about to be a refugee. Jesus is about to leave the land in which he is born, to flee somewhere because of persecution. Take, so he got, next slide. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night. This is the severity of the situation. It's so dangerous that if they leave during the day, their neighbors will see, soldiers on the road might see them, right, and they might tell the location of where Jesus is going. So it's so severe that they'll leave during the night. So that no one can say, oh shoot, I see them going to Egypt, right? It's that severe. During the night, they leave for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. No timetable. You don't know when you're coming back. Get everything you can right now. You know, it's not like we planned for this, right? Like, we're going we're to be a refugee. It's like, get everything that you can carry with you right now. During the night, we're going. And you don't know when you're coming back. That's God's wonderful plan for your life. Mary and Joseph. God's wonderful plan for you is to flee to a foreign country and stay there for an indeterminable time until Herod dies. We have this like really happy, 
you know, like the world's super clean, the hallmark rendition of Jesus' life, I found this. This is what being a refugee looks like. All right, this is the, the Syrian refugee crisis. Fleeing your home country is not a super clean, happy, you know, thing. And so was it filled with the Lord had said, through the prophet, out of Egypt, I called my son. This is God's plan all along. God's plan is to come as man, right, as a human being, to have all the anatomy of a person, and to have the experiences that we have. It's not enough for God just to be a human being, to look like us, right, to be indistinguishable from us, but he has the experiences of a human being. So when we say our God knows us, we're not just saying that. God actually lived the life of persecution that many Christians are going to face later on. Right? The early church is going to be persecuted. Christians now are going to be persecuted. God himself was persecuted. It was part of God's plan. It was part of God's plan to send his son into a world like that. So that when we declare hope and joy, right, that God is salvation for those who are hurting, we're not just saying, oh, this far away God. We're saying a God who himself has experienced this. When we're preaching a, a message to those who, you know, when I, when I go on missions, I go to like just faraway tribes and all these people who have never heard about God before. I'm not, I'm not preaching a white Western God. I'm preaching a God who identifies with the people that God has called us to reach. God himself is a refugee. God himself goes through this turmoil and is part of his plan. God enters a world that is suffering. And it brings salvation. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. And that world he loves is not some happy, you know, super clean world. As sometimes we think, like, no, back in the day it was better. It was not better back in the day. All right? It was so bad, actually, that the children of a certain age of that generation all died. Herod killed every single person of that generation. I mean, you would go crazy if that happened today. In, in San Diego and Escondido, if the ruler of Escondido, the mayor of San Diego, or the ruler of the U.S. came out and had a decree, we're going to kill all the children of a certain age. You would go ballistic. And there would be so much mourning and suffering. That's what happens in this section right here. I think sometimes we read that, we're like, okay, children die. Some of you guys have kids. One day you wake up, soldiers come to your house and say, we're killing your children. You ask why. We're not giving you an answer. We're just killing your kids. That, that's, that's persecution. That's the world Jesus enters into. Jesus identifies with people who are suffering in the world right now. I want to share you guys my story. It's an old picture of me as a kid. I am Chinese. I don't know if you can tell. I'm Chinese. <laughs> I am Chinese, and my, my family is originally from Shanghai, China. Some of you guys know your history. Um, Shanghai, China has had a crazy, crazy couple decades. Uh, my grandma tells me about the Japanese occupation of Shanghai during World War II. Um, I, take, I take mission trips, I take teams to Shanghai about twice a year. And when I go to Shanghai, I see my grandma sometimes. And she shows me the places where the Japanese occupied Shanghai. She tells me, she still remembers as a kid, the Japanese forces coming into Shanghai and the places where they quartered Japanese soldiers. Right? And those places are still there. Like she, we walk around like, oh yeah, Japanese officers stayed here, they used to have barracks here, they used to be weapons and stuff, right here. So she remembers the Japanese occupation of Shanghai. After World War II, because some of you guys know, the Communist Revolution happened. During the Communist Revolution, my, my dad worked on a commune, and he tells me all the stories about how difficult it was during that time. He makes me feel bad because I, I eat a lot, right? And he's like, oh yeah, back in my day, we had one bowl of rice. And so you better eat all your food, because <laughs> right, I couldn't eat any of that. My family, growing up in that situation, wanted to, wanted to get out of it. Right? It was a really, really bad time for a lot of uh, Chinese people. That's why there's a lot of Chinese immigrants to the U.S., right? Because co the, the communist takeover was really bad for a lot, a lot of families. My last name is Pat, P-A-T. It makes no sense. It's not Chinese. So this is the story. My Chinese name is Ba, right? Um, it's, it's, it's B in Mandarin. And then in Cantonese, it became Ba, and then from Hong Kong to the U.S., it became Pat. <laughs> right? So that's actually how it works. All right? So Mandarin, it's B, and then when my friends went to Hong Kong, it became Ba, and then it became Pat, come to the U.S. Thank you, immigration officer. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> that was a weird last name. 
So my, my family came to, to the US. We grew up in Arizona. My dad worked as a maintenance worker on the railroads. Until he saved enough, they started his own restaurant, because that's what all the Chinese do when they come to the US. We have a meeting, actually, before we leave China. We're like, we're going to take over the US one restaurant at a time. <laughs> I swear to you, every Chinese family I knew growing up had a restaurant. It was like the thing to do. All right, I've, I, there must be a meeting or like some book they all read together. Okay, but we had a restaurant. When you, when you come out of persecution, right, when you come out of being poor, and I actually have, a, have a, a grandfather who was actually put in jail for 30 years for preaching the gospel. All right, preaching the gospel for 30 years, he was put in jail. When you come out, come out of that environment, you're pretty much okay with anything, right, when you come to the U.S. So my dad opened a restaurant. And there were good days and there were bad days. Growing up in Arizona, there are not many Chinese. I don't know if you've ever been to Arizona. Um, the bad days were kind of bad. I remember um, I helped my, my family with a restaurant. You know, I was like five years old. I ran the cash register. Right? And this is back in the day where they don't tell you the change. Like they give you a dollar and it costs 77 cents. Right? I'm a little, little kid like trying to figure out change. <clears throat> but I remember some customers coming in and people would actually just start fights with my dad. And I'm like, you run a restaurant, <laughs> right? Like, why are you picking fights with people? But I understand that. But as, and as I got older, I realized this was racism. Because some people saw a Chinese family move into their neighborhood, and they didn't want that. And so some, some, some families saw, like, oh, the Chinese, they're lazy. Chinese, they're loud. They're dishonest. They're such and such. They're communists. They're you know, atheists, different things like that. And so some families just picked on our family because we look different. And I remember growing up, and I felt like I didn't want to be Chinese. I wanted to fit in like everybody else. Because it felt so awkward to be in, in this country as a person who was different than everybody else. But at the same time, there were a lot of families who were loving and caring for our family. Back, <clears throat> um, my grandma always said, during the Japanese occupation, there were missionaries in Shanghai. And when, during a time when there was not a lot of education, and during a time when there's not a lot of food, the missionaries cared for our family. And my grandma actually still has the books that the missionaries gave her like 60 years ago. That's kind of crazy. So my grandma taught my mom that Christians have really good values. Right? So when I grow up, send, send David to a Christian school. So I went to a Calvary Chapel preschool where I first learned about God. And I remember growing up, there were some families who were really, really loving towards their family. I remember like some of our... And my, my dad's customers in the restaurant would take me to like the nickel arcade and like just hang out and different stuff like that. And most of these families were Christian. And see, there's one thing to say that God is love, and there's one thing to hand me a book, right, and, and to, you know, give me like a little kid's movie to watch about Jesus Christ, and there's nothing to live it. And there were Christians who lived God is love around me. Think about during the time of Jesus. Think about the families that welcome Jesus' family. Right? You're an Egyptian family, and no one is super well off back in the day. And Jewish refugees start coming over to Egypt. Right? So your neighborhood all of a sudden see Jewish people start coming in. Some families, like this, this is the planet we're on, right? Some families definitely turn them away. They, some, I bet you some Egyptian families saw Jewish refugees and were like, I'm not dealing with that. I barely have enough as it is. But some families and communities welcomed Jesus into their community. That's a big deal. For eternity, that's a big deal. You welcomed God himself when he was in need. That is a really, really big deal. But, but think about that. You don't wake up with that kind of attitude. It's cultivated over time. right? You don't sit there in the morning like, you know what, today... I'm going to be hospitable to God. <laughs> and I'm going to wait, and there's going to be one family. I'm going to feel it, though. I'm going to feel it. So I'll, so I'll know it's God. I'm going to feel it and be like, that's God's family. Let's take him in. <laughs> pretty sure that's not what happened. I'm pretty sure what happened was some Egyptian families were already just loving of strangers and those who were different from them. And one of those families happened to be God's family, Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus. And some families, I'm sure, were just stingy and didn't want outsiders, and they probably rejected God's family. <coughs> so cultivation of love. So that's why when our, when our family in Arizona, we came into some communities, some Christians just welcomed us right away. And it's kind of crazy to think about, because my job now as, as a missionary, I'm like, 
It's crazy to think about those missionaries in the 1940s, 1950s, who cared for my grandma, right? Like, they could have never have known that like three generations later, that I would grow up and become a missionary. God does things in mysterious ways. God calls us to welcome people. God calls us to share the gospel through welcoming people. And I think it's a powerful thing. I'm standing here today because some people took the Bible seriously. Saw how God came into a world of turmoil and God came to save that world. And some Christians identified some principles in that and said, well, God is love. I'm going to live out love too. But some people do not live that out. And so, here we go. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. He gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. The Magi tricked, tricked Herod. They found a way for Jesus to, to escape. He was so mad, he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem where Jesus was born and the vicinity, just to make sure. Like, let's do this genocide, but if we're going to do genocide, let's do it right. Let's kill all the boys, even around that area. Why does Herod want to do that? We, we, don't, we don't think about motives sometimes, right? But, like, how, how many friends do you have who just wake up one day and, like, let's kill kids? <laughs> people aren't like that. I mean, some people are bad, but no one, like, not a lot of people are that bad. We just wake up, like, let's kill kids. That's cool. And let, let, let's, let's not just kill kids in one city, but around that city, just to make sure we kill all the kids we want to kill. See, what was going on in Herod's head is that he's the ruler. And he got there through a lot of difficulty, right? Because the Romans are in charge, so to be, a, to be a ruler is not an easy thing. And here Jesus is born. Jesus, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. So if Jesus fulfills his mission, what happens to Herod? What happens to a king when the King of Kings comes? Right? You lose power, your status quo changes, your comfort, your security changes. You don't know what's going to happen in your future. So he holds on to his life, his comfort, his security, his status quo, so much so, he's willing to kill children for that. And thinking through this, people had to carry out his order. Okay, he's not, he's not going to go out and do it himself. He gave orders to his, to his soldiers. Like, imagine that conversation he has, he has with the soldiers. Guys, come here, come here. All right, here's what I'm going to do. I want you to go out, get your weapons, and we're going to kill children. We're going to go to Bethlehem, kill the children there first, and then go to the surrounding areas and kill children. I, I, I used to be in the military. That's a crazy order. I'm not okay with that. I didn't wake up one day and be like, oh, that makes sense. All right, let's kill infants. That, that's why I signed to be a soldier, to kill infants. Why are people okay with that? Because their status quo changes too. If Jesus comes in and this kingdom really does come, their lives change with Herod. The success and fortune of Herod's regime rides and dies with Herod. Right? Rides and dies with the status quo being kept. If things change, right, there's uncertainty, and I'm not sure what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have food, I'm a soldier, I'm not rich anyways, and so if that's what it takes to keep things the way they are, I'm gonna kill little kids. You see, sometimes we read that in the Bible, and it seems so strange, but that's still the world we live in today. That's still the heart, the, the human heart hasn't changed in 2,000 years. There's still this, something in our heart that says, when something comes up, when people interfere with my comfort and security, I'm gonna fight back. I'm gonna fight back in little ways, and little ways become bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> One of the ways I, I check myself, and this sounds really dumb, so there's like, there's like self-checkout now at Vons. Okay? There's self-checkout and there's like always like, you know, green light, you touch the screen. And I sit there and I watch people do self-checkout. It's the same thing every time, right? It's touch the screen, scan your item, pay. And I see people sit there and like, touch, wait, screen? What do I touch? Well, what do I touch on the screen? Right? And I sit there and I'm like, I can't believe this. This is the worst thing that could ever happen to me. <laughs> Waiting two extra minutes to check out my groceries. And I get so mad, and what do we do when we get mad, right? We start saying things about people in our head. Like, oh, this person's the worst person. All right, this person's old, this person is this race, this person has da-da-da, and they're the worst person in the world. It starts making up things in our head. I check myself for that, because you know what that leads to eventually? I, I say it out loud. After I say it out loud, I start acting on it. After I start acting on it for a long time, what happens? 
That's because of my character. See, some of you guys have friends who are really discriminatory and racist or mean, spirited, or just angry all the time. How does that happen? Thoughts become words, become actions, become character. Herod didn't wake up one day and be like, I am a genocidal king. <laughs> That's who I am. That's what I do. The thoughts become words, become actions, become character. Everyone around him, same thing. That's the danger we've got to watch out for. I, I, I see myself in this text. I check myself in this text. I, I read this, I'm like, oh, that's hairy, that's ridiculous, that's crazy. And I see myself at a checkout, as dumb as that is, and I see thoughts become words, become actions, become character. And I become like that over time. Next. So then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. <clears throat> a voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Refusing to be comforted because they are no more. That's the world Jesus comes into. It's not a happy world. The situation in which Jesus comes into and what happens around his birth is that there is so much mourning they cannot be comforted. That's what scripture says. It was predicted. It said it's what happened. Jesus comes into that. And he says, God so loves the world. He sends only son. That's the world we're in right now, too. There was never a golden period where everything was happy and that we could be Christians and share the gospel and people liked us. The world has always been suffering. And there's always been turmoil. That's the world God came into, and that's the world we come into. And so, we as his messengers, we feel that discomfort also. Just, just think about this. It'd be much easier for Jesus to do his mission if he has a good childhood, right? Grown up, playing soccer, right? And then taking the SAT classes and all that stuff, and has a happy life, goes to college, and then comes out and preaches the gospel. Instead, he suffers just like everyone else, grown up. And then he becomes the messenger. Becomes God's messenger. He himself sacrifices himself on the cross to take away the sins of people. So when we think about God's messengers, is there ever going to be a time where it's super easy for us and comfortable for us to be God's messengers? It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. Because God himself didn't live that life. If I look at God himself, he is Lord of Lord, King of Kings, I saved God, you are my Lord, I want to follow you, and I look at his life, and he preaches in the midst of suffering and turmoil, and I'm like, God, I want to be a missionary, but God, help me pay off my house first. God, I know there are tribes out there who have, have no Bible, but I got student loans, I want to get married first, I want da da da. That's not, that's not reality. God preaches the gospel, lives out the gospel in the midst of suffering, in the midst of people trying to kill him, right? Actually, trying to kill him. He goes out and shares the gospel. So me as his servant, what do I do? Me as a servant, I wake up every day and I pray before I eat and stuff, and I say, God, you're my Lord, you're right. God is Lord of this house. Because I need to have his heart. I need to follow his example. If my God himself went through suffering, I need to go through suffering too. And how do I love and how do I love people like the way God wants me, wants me to be loved? I think about those who worship God during God's time, during when God was made. You know how they serve God? Welcoming the stranger. You know how people worship God when he was a baby? Welcoming that family who's fleeing from Israel. Right? God's a baby at this point. You can't follow his teachings yet. He's like one years old, two years old. So how do you worship God then? How about you welcome the person who is a refugee? who is different from you. That's how I experienced the gospel growing up. I, I mean, you can tell me and show me kids' videos and like all that stuff. Veggie Tales didn't exist when I was a kid. <laughs> but family showed me the gospel by the way they care for our family. <clears throat> how come some families are racist and they pick fights with my dad? And how come some families take me to the Nickel Arcade and play video games? They're, they're, they're both people. They both live in my neighborhood. So why are they so different? Oh, one's Christian. Huh, how come every person who's nice to our family is Christian? 
Oh, invite me to church? Yeah, I go to church. All the people I like are already there. <laughs> All the people I like are already there. Sure, I'll go to church. Next slide. If you're, if you're offended by half new beauty, don't look at this. <laughs> I am a bodybuilder. There, this is what I do, the context of this. All right. So for me growing up, and then grow, growing up and thinking about all the blessings that I've received, I think about then what is God's calling for my life? So my story as a, as a bodybuilder, um, I played a lot of sports when I was in high school, but there was one coach who made a difference in my life because I used to work out at the gym, and I'd be like, hey coach, like what do I do to, like, to be buff? He's like, hey, drink whole milk and eat peanut butter and work out. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah. All right, coach. <laughs> and I would work out, I would drink whole milk, and I eat peanut butter. And then I remember there was one time there was an online contest for Teen Bodybuilder. I was like 17. Teen Bodybuilder of the Week. And I sent him my, my bodybuilding pictures, right? Like, can I be a bodybuilder? And they're like, you won! Teen Bodybuilder of the Week. And I was like, oh man, I can be a bodybuilder. So I, I did my first show. I won, I won San Diego. And then I went to the USA's. And then I won in the, in the USA's and became Mr. Teen USA. And then so the last, for the last 11 years, I've been, I've been doing bodybuilding. Um, this last year, I finally turned pro, became professional, and then um, I was actually elected captain of the USA team, in my, my first year as a professional. When I think about why God has made me a bodybuilder, or when I think about why God has made pro athletes, right? Think about, in your head, imagine a professional athlete in your head. And some of you guys have really bad <coughs> images of that, right? People who are selfish, People who would like do the money for the glory, for the vanity of it. When I turned pro, one of the things I thought about is, what does this all mean? What does all this blessing mean? What does it mean that growing up, I had a coach who believed in me, invested in me, and was a blessing on my life? What was that for? What, what does it mean that I'm like the only Chinese guy who does bodybuilding? <laughs> it's like literally me, right? I was at a press conference with the other pros, right? And it was like, it was an international competition. Okay, so there's guys from like Czech Republic, from Uganda, guys like that. I'm like, Captain USA, like the Chinese guy. <laughs> 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 like, what? <laughs> right, the only Chinese guy there is also the Captain of the USA, it's kind of funny. <laughs> so what is it all for? One of the things that I've been blessed to have the opportunity to do is to work with those with disabilities in Shanghai, China. That's my mission. My mission is I work with orphans and those with disabilities. Um, one of the things that my, myself and my team wanted to do is we wanted to reach out to those who are most at risk. China has a one-child policy, right? It's easy to have an abortion there. Um, the government wants to control population so you can only have one child. So either you, if you have two, you either get the second one aborted or you abandon them. Right? Some, some families will abandon their first child if, it has, if their child has a deformity or disability of some kind. Because if you're a poor farmer, right, you want a child that can you know, be a farmer, to construction, manufacturing, stuff like that. So a lot of kids get abandoned. So our team is like, you know what? We want to reach out to this group, right? Because there are actually more than a million orphans like that in Shanghai. The majority of orphans actually have disabilities, right? And that's why they're abandoned. And so that's what we that's what we do on the mission field. So coming back, to, so I come back to the U.S. I think about my bodybuilding, and it's been awesome because our league actually has a category for those who are disabled. All right. I I, I thought about this, like you know, in basketball. If, you can, if you're in a wheelchair, you can't jump high. Because so you can't compete against pros. Right? In football, if you're in a wheelchair, you can't you know, wheel yourself down the field. In bodybuilding, it's actually not necessarily a huge disadvantage to you. I actually know professional bodybuilders who are disabled. All right? one, of, one, of my, one of my friends, he, he's an amputee. He has leg amputated in a car accident. And he's huge. He's like a zip code. <laughs> right? like, he, like he's wearing pants. You don't, you don't see him as a person with disability. He's like this gigantic dude. He's a bodybuilder. And so that was really inspiring for me. So I was thinking about, as a professional bodybuilder, what do I want to do? Why was I blessed? And so I've made it a point in my professional career now to help those with disabilities to also be bodybuilders too. I don't think anyone else in here is a bodybuilder, and that's okay. <laughs> you all have different blessings. Why are you here? Why has God given you your place in life, your talents, your community, your family, all the gifts you've been given? The thing is, we're always hard pressed, but even as a Christian, we always feel like, you know what, we can give if we want to. Right? Even though, as busy as we are, as cash strapped as we are, we can always give if we want to. I'm asking you guys to live out the Christian life 
and to give, and to love, and to care, and to welcome. Because this Christmas season, we can get mad at you know, Starbucks not carrying Merry Christmas on their cups. They're like, how do people know about Jesus unless their cup says Merry Christmas? Yeah. I'm saying to you, <coughs> go out and live the gospel. In the time of Jesus, the land of Israel, mourning and refusing to be comforted. There are people who are in so much pain that refuse to be comforted, and you know people like that in your life. You know families like that in your life. You know individuals in your life who are suffering and going through so much stuff, they won't even listen to you because they're going through so much suffering. Be in that place. Be patient. Love and care for them. I'll tell you, when I was a kid in Arizona, I didn't, like, it wasn't the first day. I'm like, oh, Christians, I get it. You guys are loving. I'm being a Christian too. Right? It took years and years of people loving my family. It took years and years of that. I'm asking you, will you, will you do the same thing? Will you love those in your community, in your life, for years and years? Will you give and care and love for years and years? See, that's the thing about character, right? Character is only really tried and expressed over time. Bad people with low character can do good deeds. All right? The worst people you know can do a good deed. They can buy a meal for a homeless person. Right? They can care for a little kid once. But over time, that's character. That's a Christian character. Next slide. Who is God's messenger? I thought this was hilarious, all right? Because <laughs> apparently Santa is God's messenger. <laughs> right? Joy to the world. Here are some bu- here's a bunch of toys. The joy to the world. <coughs> we are God's messenger. So this Christmas time, when we think about what is the message of Christmas, how will they know that Jesus has come? Is this from right here? How will they know unless someone preaches? How will Escondido know? How will your neighborhood know? How will your circle of friends, your family that you see this Christmas? How will they know unless you tell them, unless you live it out, unless you show them? It takes time. It takes time. I encourage you guys, there are so many opportunities here at this church. I'm so glad, you know, Kirk and Asad just announced a bunch of ways to protect your community. Some of you guys always wonder, like, I'll do it once God calls me. God's messenger stood in front of this auditorium and gave you opportunities. Okay, that's God's calling. There are opportunities for you to reach out to love your community. I'm telling you as a person who experienced that growing up, it makes a difference. It makes a difference. And you might not see it right away. I don't think I was the greatest five-year-old in the world. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I wasn't. I probably wasn't the greatest six-year-old, and seven-year-old, and eight-year-old in the world either. But over time, God worked in my life. Because people continue to invest in me. That's your neighborhood. That's the people in your life. No, it's not going to happen overnight. But I think this church is going to be here for a while, hopefully. And you guys are going to preach, and you guys are going to love, and you guys are going to care for them for a while, hopefully. And that's how we share the gospel. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, I thank you for this time. I thank you. You have given us your word. That you have called us. That you have made us your messenger. That you are the great hope. That you have come for all people that we might be rescued. So God, help us to love and to care and to be light to our community, especially at this time of Christmas. May we worship you and glorify you in this. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah, join me in thanking you.